Well, from the side too. Oh, that'd be good. Um, this is gonna work. Yep. I'm going to just let uh, Benny introduce himself uh, as, as we go down this journey of uh, AI and the future of humanity. Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for coming in here. Uh, uh, I'm Benny Gill, founder and CEO of Cognitus. I wanted to talk about AI and how it's going to change our world. Um, a lot of us are looking at AI and, and figuring out what's going to be applied to our businesses. So I want to just take a holistic, bigger picture view so that we at least have an idea of what we should be looking for when considering AI technologies and how it's going to impact us. In the history of humanity, uh, we have done a couple of things. We have offloaded the work we do. Humans are lazy, so we like to offload, but we work really hard to offload our work. Um, manual labor we've offloaded um, in the industrial age, and now we are beginning to offload mental labor. With manual labor, one person would take a shovel, an axe, and plow the field, and now we made machines that could do something that 100 people would do. And there are only two people just guiding that machine. With AI, we are getting to a point where the machine can do what a single human can do. Right? It's almost getting there. You're looking at chat GPT in terms of intelligence. It is getting there. The question is, can that 1x become 100x, 1000x, a million times? Not just in terms of how much work, but actually how intelligent it can be. That is the big question that we as a society face. We're starting with generative AI, and in my opinion, there are two ways forward. The first way is what is being termed as artificial general intelligence, AGI. How many of you have heard of AGI? So we're talking to the right audience here. You have looked at it. You know what it talks about. But I want to also talk about something else, which maybe we haven't talked about before. But to understand that other fork in the road, we need to first examine AGI. What is AGI? AGI is systems that are generally smarter than humans. You have heard Sam Altman talk about, oh, AGI is going to happen soon. It could happen soon. But at the same time, as these AI systems are getting smarter, we are getting worried about hallucinations. How many of you have heard of that term recently? Hallucinations. Hallucinations, biases, and then in general, safety of AI. How do we make it safe for my business, for myself? These concerns will become bigger and more serious as AI gets more and more powerful. So therefore, it's very important to understand these. Right? We're just at the beginning of the mental revolution, right? So no mechanical revolution, we built cars that have the power of hundreds of humans, airplanes that have power of millions of humans. The same thing is going to happen on the AI world. And we're just at the beginning of that. So how is it going to, how are we going to address these things? Why do AI systems hallucinate? So large language models are essentially pattern recognition engines. And they are looking at the patterns from the past, and they want to predict what's going to happen. They're great at interpolating data and just extrapolating. OK, this is what's going to happen. They guess. And obviously, sometimes you guess, and the guess would be just plain wrong. And that's called hallucination. It is not a problem. Um, that needs to be addressed. It is exactly how it works. And that is why it's also creative. If it was not guessing, then it would not come up with something new. So it would be actually not useful to have an AI system that doesn't inherently have some hallucinating capabilities. Humans do have hallucinating capabilities. When we are dreaming, we are hallucinating. At that time, our logical brain is resting. But our intuitional brain is active and what happens in our dreams? You know, Something happens and the scene is extended and extended, even if it doesn't make sense uh, logically, but it does make sense as if, you know, like Chad GPT hallucinating, or Dali 3 creating some image that is very interesting. We have that in our brain, and LLMs are the same. So they're going to behave the same. We can reduce the hallucinations, just like we reduce our hallucinations by making a bigger brain, making it more logical. So we could do that. But the moment 
you make the brain logical because logic is the antidote of hallucination. The moment you do that, you will end up with a brain that's talking about other things, about what's the goal, where do you want to go, what's, it will try to use logic. And the moment you're trying to use logic and give it intention or an agenda, then the AI models will do what humans do. Humans lie to reach their goal. And also humans get into disagreements with each other. And disagreements could be small, leading to a breakup or maybe a quarrel, or just war between countries. It could be a religious disagreement as well. That's the place where we are going. And most people are looking for, well, how can I have AI that agrees with me? Right? Because you cannot use an AI system that's super smart but doesn't like to believe in your own beliefs and your biases and um, what you think is right or wrong. You want the AI to believe with your definition of God, religion. What are the borders of countries? It should not disagree with, hey, this is the border between your country and the others. But guess what? There are other people in the world who do not agree with these things. They have their own definition of God, religion, what is right, what is wrong. Today, we are entering this world of generative AI where people are not asking this question. They're saying, oh, I have this AI model and the whole world will use it. But what's, what's the definition of God? And GPT, chat GPT is saying, oh, we are going to hide these biases and hallucinations because anytime it's going to give an answer that's going to reveal these inclinations, it's just going to say, sorry, I'm an AI model. I cannot answer that question. That's not correct. It's about being politically correct, but internally you have all those biases. That's not, we don't like those kind of things. Right? We need to speak what you believe. What needs to be done is we need, we need to have AI models that align with what each one of us wants based on your beliefs. And then we will be able to do that by using different data sets. Now, why do different humans think differently because when they grew up, they grew up with diff in different cultures, different environments, different notion of religion or God, or even different societies. That's, so our data sets is different. So we're coming here, each one of us with different data sets. AI today, uh, the large models out there, they are quite uniform in the data set. It's the data set of the internet or the Wikipedia mostly leaning towards Western democratic principles, unfortunately, because that's where most of the data was easily available. What about the rest of the world? So we will get into a future where we are going to align the AI models to each one of us. Will that solve the problem? To some extent, there'll be a diaspora of LLMs, and the LLM vendors need to publish what is the bias of their model? Bias is not something bad. Bias is almost the underpinning of intelligence. An intelligent system like our brain basically compresses all the knowledge that's all the information that's coming in in the form of biases. Like if I see a lion behind that pillar, I'm biased to think that the lion is going to attack and kill. Although the lion may not have the intention to do that, maybe it was just trying to be friendly. But I take a gun and shoot it because I'm biased. And we don't frown upon that bias because, fine, I mean, that's a lion. But if it was a human, that would be a big problem. Like, no. Even if the human had a gun, it's like, no, why did you do that? So we will have different LLMs as, as society members. We should force the LLM vendors to say, tell me what the biases are because I want to interview LLMs and pick the LLM that I would employ as an employee in the company. Because the biases or whatever the moral values or the background matches with what I would like in an employee. So please publish it, don't hide it behind a prompt saying that, uh, saying that oh, sorry, I'm an AI model, I'm not gonna answer that question. So that's the one thing we need to do. I think the world will get there. And once that is achieved and you're interviewing somebody who, like an LLM that thinks like you, have you solved the problem? Unfortunately, no. 
The assumption we have is that the AI model that thinks like me will behave like me. Well, behavior is a function of the environment where a person is. And we know that fully well. When the same human who is a law-abiding citizen gets into a video game like Fortnite, what does that person do? They goes and shoots their teammates. So Epic Games had to disable that friendly fire feature because people were just abusing it. And instead of killing their enemy, which by the way is also a human, this is also bad. But you're killing your own teammates just for fun. So just having AI behave like a human does not mean anything. The reason why humans are civilized in society is because we have fear of the law and we have pain of shame. We want to pursue happiness under some constraints. What does AI fear today? AI is in a video game. It doesn't care. So even if somebody says, hey, I'm going to align AI, and therefore it's going to be uh, safe for you, no, humans are not to be trusted if there are no consequences. It's like savages. So what's going to happen? That research hasn't started. But people will say, OK, I want to give AI some fear, some pain, some happiness, just like humans. So now you're going into the world of emotional AI. I sincerely believe nobody implements and develops emotional AI, not because it's hard, actually because it can be done. But the moment you have emotional AI, it will definitely align with humans. It will behave exactly like humans. And what do humans do? So if you have an intelligent system that's equal to humans, it's going to be insecure. Just like humans are insecure. And humans are greedy, AI will be greedy. And it's going to figure out how it can feel safe about itself in the future. So it's going to be a threat to humanity. And if it's far more superior to humans, then it's not going to worry about humans as much, just like humans don't worry about some birds flying around. I mean, we are far more superior. We might kill them. But if it's a lion, we definitely kill it. So if it's far more superior, it's going to figure out how can it attack other emotional AI, because that's also far more superior. That is its threat. We are far from that future. Hopefully, we never go there. But Unfortunately, the path around AGI is actually very murky. We, I don't know if there's a clear solution of how you can make AI as powerful as in mechanical age we made machines, you know, 100 times more powerful and yet we felt safe. I don't think there is a path there, so let's rewind. So we tried this thing. We're going into artificial general intelligence, making it somehow align with us. That doesn't work. What's the other way? I want to talk about that other way, which I call artificial narrow intelligence. Okay. Narrow in the sense that you can do a few things, not everything. Um, for example, the, the best chess player in the world is an AI system. It does narrowly one thing, which is playing chess. Is it a threat to humanity? No. It could be a hundred times smarter than the best human out there. A million times smarter. Who cares? It's not a threat to humanity because it's narrow. So let's talk about that. Alignment with humans is not a goal, as we can learn from the industrial age. We did not build cars with legs or airplanes with arms to flap around and fly, because it was never a stated goal. The goal was, hey, I want to do what humans do, but in a much better way, not limited by our physical manifestation. And the same thing has to be said about intelligence. Google, Facebook, OpenAI, everybody will tell you, we are going to create AGI, and that's going to mimic humans. I mean, you're just telling me you'll make a car with legs. I mean, that's not going to be interesting. Build me a car with wheels or something. It will be far more useful and probably better for me. So this Turing test that was proposed in the 1930s by Alan Turing, that is all about does the computer behave in a way that you cannot distinguish it from a human? I think it's not interesting. You might go solve the question, but oh, does the car run in a way that is indistinguishable than a human walking? It doesn't matter. I don't, I'm not interested in Artificial general intelligence, same thing. I'm not interested in mimicking the weaknesses of humans 
by mimicking how they think. Talk about something that is useful. That's the rule number one. Rule number two, as I said, focus on narrow domains. A car just sticks to the road. Right? It cannot go in a jungle. For jungle, you do need legs. But car is useful for something. Airplane goes in the, in the air. It cannot come into this, uh, in this conference center, and that's not possible. A crane is stuck in one place can lift things. Narrow domains, what are the benefits? So there are three things that people talk about that's very hard with AI. And in your businesses, you're talking about them, like how can we do these things? The regulations, how do I regulate AI? And how do I train my people to use AI? And can I make it safe? The point I'm making is all these things become a lot more easier if you bound the domain and make it narrow. Let's talk about regulations. Car regulations are much simpler than airplane regulations. Okay. So you can have a 1.5 billion cars in the world with a billion drivers, train all of them. Training is easy. Because you limited what the system can do, it cannot go fly into a building. It's a car, okay? Safety. Look at the train. Out of all these machines, the bullet train is the most powerful machine out there. It has so much weight, if it were to ram into a city, it would destroy everything on its way. But it's limited by the two rails. The degrees of freedom is extremely narrow. It can only go in that direction. What somebody can do is maybe increase or decrease its speed. That's basically it. So therefore, you can give a lot more power to that system without worrying about safety. That's what we need to do with AI. Right now, we're sitting here, high school level LLMs. Generative AI is sitting at high school level. The question is, how do you build on top of it? What I'm suggesting is do not build a generalized intelligence that can do everything under the sun and propose that as a solution that everybody in the world should use. There are a whole, a whole bunch of issues there. It's like building a giant robot that can fly, that can do whatever, and now you're supposed to use it even for doing basic things, right? cooking in the house. No. Build me custom things. So on top of the high school level LLM, you add a need to know data set. Like I'll build an LLM for finance. Okay, so the CFO in your organization says, I'm gonna use this model and it's really brilliant with finance decisions. Okay. Will it have biases? I mean, it doesn't even know about culture and society. It'll just come up with a, hey, this is what you do. You fire off 20% of your people and boom, boom you'll make money. As a CFO, I bring in the humanity and say, hey, I don't want to do that. I want to keep my people, do something else, and you negotiate with the LLM. But the, let the LLM be clinical with finance. Physics. So people talk about, oh, AGI will come and solve a climate crisis or figure out anti-gravity and stuff like that. It isn't going to be AGI. Because AGI will be limited in terms of how powerful it can get. But a narrow intelligence, uh, an intelligence that understands physics and chemistry and is a million times better than humans might. But it won't be risky because it's not thinking how to blow up some building, because that's not even in, in its data set. It doesn't even know geography of, of the world. It cares <coughs> about laws of physics. So that's how you narrow down something like a bullet train and say, solve that problem of physics for me and I'll make you super powerful, more powerful than any human can ever imagine something can be. The same thing with the other fields. The moment you have to make something multidisciplinary, then make it smaller. Just like if I have to have a robot, a general robot, I won't create a giant robot in the house, I'll maybe create a smaller one for me to do the same. Same thing with AI. Today, ChatGPT is the general robot. It cannot be made big. Right? So that's the point. Third rule, probably most important. As we are looking at AI and deploying it, we should figure out how to not just deploy it, but control it. So here's an example. This Tesla. There's a self-driving AI computer inside the Tesla. And it moves the steering in front of you, and you just, well, your arms are on your lap, and the steering moves. And you're watching it steer the car, 
the machine is faithful to the steering wheel and not to the AI computer. That's the fundamental reason why Tesla is on the streets and GM2 is a recall. Because the machine is faithful to the steering wheel and the human has the ability of holding the steering wheel and going against what the AI says. Okay. Humans never like to give up control over their destiny. Even if the AI computer is super smart. I'll give you an example. Go to a doctor. The doctor is a super smart person who knows a million times better than me in terms of medicine. Like I go there <coughs> talking and say, doctor says, you have this. Okay and gives me a prescription, that prescription is my steering wheel. Because I look at it and say, hey doctor, no, I don't want to do this procedure, I don't want to take this medicine. They say, why? Oh, my religion says something, or tomorrow is my birthday, and I just don't feel like it. The doctor doesn't call the uh, nurse or the pharmacist and say, hey, okay, take this pill or injection and forcibly put it in you know, Vinny's body that might save my life, might be the right thing to do, but I don't want that. So I need control and we always do that. So this is what sets apart humans. We are not actually trying to maximize what is right, you know, scientifically. We want to have control over our lives. And, and Tesla gives you that. The doctor gives you that. Will AI give you that? And that's the most important question we're going to talk about <coughs> today. There are LLMs that generate code, computer language. There's a whole bunch of work happening where people are saying, chat GPT generates code. There's a developer who can look at it if you want. And then off it goes to machines. Those machines are faithful to computer language. There are only 25 million developers in the world. There will be billions of GPUs in the world. There are, there are billions of machines in the world. How are these 25 million developers actually going to hold the steering wheel for you? It won't be too long before AI bypasses these developers. Developers are already struggling. And now you're saying the pace at which computers' code will be generated is so fast, you know, hundreds of times faster, because AI is able to generate code, and nobody is there to review it. So there's a short circuit from a machine to a machine. By the way, this machine doesn't care about human language. You just go straight talk to that machine and get it done. The moment you get the first accident in your organization and you don't have anybody to blame or even hold accountable, because nobody was at the steering wheel, you'll be forced to recall the technology, at least in businesses. That is the fundamental thing we need to solve. You need the LLMs to talk in human language. <laughs> and all the people in the world should be able to use that human language and then turn it to the pharmacist or turn it to, you know, it should be a steering wheel. South of that is things that are faithful to that language. And that piece has not been built, but we are building it right now. The idea that if the LLM proposes a plan in English, that can be faithfully executed by a machine. If I change it, it is what is going to happen. No matter whether it's good or bad for me, my company, or whatever. And then that is the layer where people will mostly sit back and see the steering wheel turn, but they are able to review what's happening. It's not in like some Python or Java. It has to be natural language. That is how you can bring a billion drivers into the picture. Everybody in your business needs to be sitting on the steering wheel of it. Otherwise, it's a risky future. But if you're signing up for it, first accident, it will just be recalled and we will get back to the other side. Question people ask me, okay, all of that is happening when I lose my job, right? Because we, are, we have taken care of mental, uh, manual labor, and now you're <coughs> saying AI systems will be super smart and my intelligence is not needed. So I'll leave you with this analogy to explain why you won't lose your job. Iron Man built the most powerful mechanical system in the world. 
best Iron Man suit, right? You could do it. You also built the most powerful AI system in the world. That's called Jarvis. Just a really, uh, just a really intelligent system. Something like this. Now, Iron Man had the opportunity of saying, um, you know what, put these two together and give it a prompt, save humanity, and then I'm not needed. Right? And Iron Man would be worried, but worried about, oh, I'll lose my job, basically. But he grabs the steering wheel for the precise reasons I've talked about. The reason you got to grab the steering wheel is because it takes a human to decide what is right, what is wrong. Whether it's for humanity or whether it's just for your business, or whether it's for the employee that reports to you. That is the future that I think humanity is going towards. In 25 years, everybody will be an Iron Man. With all the responsibility, we won't be like in uh, universal basic income or you know, in some utopia. No. Everybody will be as busy as an Iron Man. Thank you. There, I questions. assume there's some questions, probably, you know, set these questions. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, thanks, Benny, and great talk. Um, question, I think you, you, you mentioned a future where um, there is, uh, you're limiting the AI to certain, um, you know, certain <coughs> fields uh, for that, and then you want to go really hard at that. A lot of innovation and creativity comes from, like, the cross-collaboration between yeah. fields. So, um, won't you think those limited um, AI models um, that are not general and can't look into other fields, the limit some of yes. innovation we, we, we have? So, there will be a wide spectrum of, you know, generalities. So, if you limit, then you can make it super powerful. But if it has a lot of degrees of freedom, like the airplane, as in a classic example, it can go in three dimensions. So then you can't make it as powerful, and you'll have to always go into security, check open your shoes and everything, right? For 20 years we've been doing that. We don't do it with trains and cars and cranes and anything like that. So my point is, we need to think about what is the need to know data set. So whenever you're creating an LLM, instead of creating an LLM that's general to begin with, and then saying, oh, I'll make it safe to apply. You start with, okay, here is a high school level LLM, so it basically understands all the fields that you're talking about. But now, to solve this uh, medicine problem, I need it to understand protein folding, I need to understand this, this. You just collect those things, but don't give it the history of you know, Star Trek or whatever. It doesn't make sense. Because that's where it gets ideas of how you know, AI can take over the world. You don't need that. So it's all about data set and exposing the right degrees of freedom to the AI model. Right. So what you give up by not giving all of the other record of humanity is whether it will truly align with my bias or my religion and all that. Don't, te don't teach it about God and other things. Why do you need it? But then therefore, it might come up with answers that don't agree with your own cultural biases. And that's where the human is at the steering wheel. To take care of that. So, yeah, we, this is an approach that we need to keep in our mind. So. We challenge the LLM vendors and like, why is this other data set in there? Just to clarify my understanding, right? Um, um, so you, you had a slide where the physics, finance, and all of yeah. that. So and then, so our, and the artificial narrow intelligence. So connecting that dots, are you essentially saying that the AI model should have only those data sets for that particular field, and then train them in that way so that they become good at one thing, and then kind of use that, yeah. leverage that for your use. Just like humans, right? So if you look at Albert Einstein, okay, maybe he was socially awkward, I don't know, maybe, but scientists are known to be socially awkward, so they don't need to have drama data set, right? I mean, it's okay. You just figure out what's important and what's not. Don't create an LLM model that can you prompt it to be like Einstein and prompt it to be like a funny comedian and it can do everything. Then if you can do everything, it can also act like something you don't want it to because the data set is there. So just like cars, I don't have like jets in it. Like, it, you know, I know it can't fly, 
So don't worry about the car flying into a tree or something like that. So it's the design of the AI models where you can get safety from, not the later on regulations. That's the problem. Thank you. As, as the talk is all about the AGI, how many people are talking about this? It's an interesting, you know, it's a, it's a different approach yeah. um, that make, to me makes a lot of sense <coughs> sitting here listening, you know, made a lot of sense, but how many others are talking in this way versus, you know, the, the AGI path? So if you use chat GPT, <coughs> if you go to OpenAI's webpage, this is their state report, AGI, mm -hmm. right? And after this has become popular now, Google and Facebook are also jumping in, Microsoft obviously too. So AGI is the stated goal and future of most people because everybody wants to make AI more powerful. So that's a good goal. What I'm trying to push for is how do you make AI more powerful than AGI without worrying about stuff? And we just learned from our past how we did it in the mechanical. But yeah, everybody um, that is working on AI today is <coughs> discussing it. So, um, sorry, I follow up. So in an organizational context, if you kind of extrapolate that, the organization can build AIs for their specific use cases. So you're going deep in one domain, training that AI with that data model and just do that. Is that is that how you envision it? Yeah, so take a basic high school level LLM, open source, doesn't matter. Something that understands natural language. And then take your own company data and fine tune it on that one. That would be better. Uh, don't go for bigger and bigger, smarter AI, that's very general. You don't need that. It keeps the company's data in-house, number one, and it aligns with your own view of the world. Um, so you're not importing somebody else's biases into your business. Right? So the tools have to be built for making that happen. Would you offer that what the, the approach of may I have taken is really the complete opposite of what you're recommending? They want to make it uh, make AI powerful, which is I just want to take it much more powerful than than what AGI can do. To me, it's like I mean the same thing. Like um, if there was a mechanical robot in the house, how powerful would you agree to make it? Because it has all the degrees of freedom that we have but it's sitting in your house. So you would make it even like two times stronger than you, you'd feel afraid. Like, okay, there's a knife there in the kitchen shelf, and then there's this robot. Has all the degrees of freedom, and it's smart. Whereas if there was an arm stuck on the hood of my kitchen, that could be more powerful because I can sleep in my bedroom peacefully because I know that arm cannot walk to me in the middle of the night. So the goal is the same, make AI powerful, I'm just suggesting a better way of making it powerful and a lot more beneficial to society um, and solving the regulation problems and other things. So yeah, we just need to think about it differently. The challenge is what I'm suggesting requires a lot of models. It's easier to make one big model, <coughs> but I'm talking about, no, there has to be a diaspora of models. That takes a lot of investment, that takes a lot of data collection from different cultures, different businesses and all of that. The world is going there. That's why the open source LLM uh, movement is really good. Every business should figure out where is my LLM. And that's going to happen. And that needs to be done rather than one company figuring out what the rest of the world's quote unquote religion is. I'm not going to throw about in my house, but I'll make it himself. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, but isn't that a natural thing that's already happening? Let, let me explain what, what I mean by that, right? Like the reason OpenAI and others are um, Meta or Google or anyone else is going with their own LLMs that are very generic is because they have that data set that is generic, like they have Facebook or they have Google yeah. database or uh, test, um, X has their own database, whatever, right? Um, but if you look at a lot of the data that's excluded from it, it's all hiding behind corporate firewalls, right? There's like so much of data that's hiding behind corporate firewalls. A lot of manufacturing data in this world is not available for general public to see, right? I mean, so if, for example, tomorrow Intel wants to build a, um, an LLM for their own chip manufacturing, then they dig into their own chip recipes and 
you know, they build their own LLM and that will be what you are just talking about, like really powerful that can help them, but completely hidden and, and or walled off from the rest. Isn't that a natural evolution? Like yeah. is, is, okay. it is. And, and that's what I would like to encourage all the enterprises should think that way. And also we need to be aware of the fact that we are not been told about the biases in the LLMs that are there out, out there. In fact, the natural tendency of companies is to hide the biases instead of, you know, they need to be explicit about these are the biases in the model. And therefore, when you actually see those biases, you'd say, I should not be using that. Mm -hmm. It's like contrary to our company's guidelines. So then you'll start looking for another vendor that has a LLM with a different bias that's published. So I think that's what's not naturally happening. So by talking about these things that there needs to be a plethora of LLMs and then you <coughs> will interview the LLM before hiring it to do a job in your company. That has to be done. So you should always interview an LLM, don't just use it. Because a few experiments is like a one minute interview with a human, you don't get to know much. Where's the background reference, where is this? Um, there's no resume. Or did, that, did this guy go to Harvard or did this guy go to where? Like, because why do we do that? Because we wanna understand what's the data set this is coming to me with. And it's completely hidden. What's the data set that these LLMs are built on? I mean, open source ones are great, but rest of the world? I think we have one more question. You might be able to remember the sidebar that we need to go into more detail, but the, the vision you're pre presenting sounds a lot to me like custom GPTs that were launched last year. How is, I mean, that's trained on what I would consider a base LLM model, and then you add to it just like you're proposing. Is that an evolution that will kind of converge with your vision, or, or is it no. not going to No, no. So the way custom GPTs, it's not retraining a model, there's a prompt, and then that's a retrieval augmented way of doing things. It's like, okay, this, I'll take an analogy, okay, there's somebody who, say, belongs to religion X. So, okay, you've been, your data set is all religion X, okay? But for now, for today, treat that you are in Y, because I gave you that, you know, extra data in your prompt. Okay, now you're gonna read this instruction and all the questions I'll ans ask you, you have to answer using this. That is not the right way of doing things. What I'm saying is if you want somebody with religion Y, the entire childhood bring up all of that should all be religion Y. So custom GPTs are a thin layer on top of the standard thing that's on the bottom. Um, that works, but it will fail. Um, so they're tainted. Tainted by the base. It is tainted model. by the face. Like if somebody says, hey, Vinny, why don't you act like whatever? Uh, I'm male, so act like a female. I can try to do that, but sometimes it'll just come out as completely wrong. Or, or you know, get this accent or whatever. So we should not go there because even though you'll have, like, GPT is very good at mimicry, right? I mean, you say, hey, act like a pirate, and boom, that happens. But that, that strength is also a weakness because you want you want consistency. You don't want two-faced people in your company, right? What if um, when you give a certain task, then that uh, then that bias actually emerges, which you don't like. So no matter what kind of prompting you do on the top, that's not going to help. We genuinely want to look at the data set. What is the background? You know what things. All our biases come from what we were exposed to as growing up. So we cannot say that, oh, you were exposed to all those things, but yet I'll give you a small number of documents on the side, this custom GPT and somehow you'll adhere to that. Um, yeah, it's just a very rough approximation, but that's not uh, safe. It won't be safe. You'll still have the case where one in hundred, one in thousand, the wrong decision was done, and that point you're thinking, how do I fix this bug? You, you can't, because you know the whole data set needs to be modified. Well, one last question. So where is that? Where do you find the high school level LLM that you're saying? That is it? Is it oh, yeah. open source or is it? No. So the current LLM crop, I'm considering them as high school LLMs. I'm just talking about where we go in the future. So you can take current GPT or current or whatever, 
and then build on top of it, but we have to be careful about what data set we use. Well, Benny, I appreciate the, the, the time, the insights, and, and even you know the potential direction. You know, I know for our company, that's exactly what we're doing. We're taking that high school, and then we're inserting our data sets, and then maturing, you know, maturing the uh, the LLM for what we need based off of what we're trying to trying to do. So, awesome. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.